Good morning, everyone. My name is Diana Ignacio. And I'm Brandon Torres. And we are from D&B Machines Incorporated here to present to you our Acme 64-bit processor. So our agenda for today is our introduction, baseline overview, processor design enhancements, future enhancements, and closing comments and question and answer session. So the history for why we chose our name, um, as you can see in the definition up there, ACME means the highest or most critical point or stage. And we chose this name for our processor because we felt like um, the characteristics for our processor is that it's gonna be the top for the market and the best choice for our customer. And we included this quote because we felt that um, it was a good philosophy during um, our process of working on this processor. If you're not making mistakes, then you're not doing anything as positive that a doer makes mistakes. So we felt like um, as we were on our learning curve, we kept making mistakes to hit the new productivity. So you were doing a lot. Yes. We're making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> a lot of mistakes, but we're tasting. we ended we're tasting. up accomplishing. Okay, the baseline features that we have available to us are Harvard memory architecture. This gives us a data memory module and an instruction memory module. Uh, our different addressing modes are uh, immediate addressing mode, register direct, and register indirect. The immediate allows us to take the value that is stored in the instruction and use it. Uh, register direct points us directly to the register, and then we use those register contents. And then register ind indirect uh, points to the register, and we use that effective address to uh, use the content that we need to use. Uh, and in our machine register set, the registers that we have available to us to use, or the main ones at least, are, are we have 32 64-bit uh, integer registers which we use uh, in our integer data path to perform integer instructions. We're allowed to store them, uh, modify them, read them. Uh, we also have 32 64-bit uh, floating point registers which we have the same capabilities for but floating point uh, instead of integer. Uh, a stack pointer to store our stack address, uh, instruction pointer to store our uh, instruction address, a memory address register uh, so we can send an address to the uh, data memory module, and our status register to store our status file. So here we have the instructions that we've included for our processor. Um, we haven't added any more instructions to the baseline instructions. So it's including all of the um, integer operations, the triple operand, double operand, and all of our jump instructions. And let's continue here. Uh, this is a block diagram of our overview of the entire processor. Right here we have the execution unit uh, and the control unit feeding it all the signals. Uh, we have our input output data module there. Our Instruction module here and our data module here. Uh, these are all interconnected. Uh, you know they function as one. In CC. Next. This is our execution unit. Uh, our bus interface unit connects to our. Well, these are connected to the control unit. These are the signals that control the uh, buffer registers, along with the uh, stack pointer and the instruction pointer. Uh, these are our output signals to the memory module. These send uh, our data out, so that would be our read, I'm sorry, our write buff register or our floating point out register. And this is our BIU. This controls uh, well, all these buffer registers here along with the information register, uh, the IP, SP, and the MART. Um, the write buff is used to well, write to the data module. Uh, our read buff is used to uh, send data out from the data module or instruction module, whatever we would need to, into either our integer data path or into our floating point data path. Uh, they, the, the MUX here has to be done so we can, one of the instructions was an or high instruction and it required uh, the lower bits to be set to zero in order for a correct function. So we added that, and we went ahead and added the other one in case we needed it for a different instruction. Okay. This is our integer data path. 
Uh, this basically controls all the interference instructions. Um, we added this much right here in order to allow uh, our or high uh, instruction to work correctly. Otherwise, we couldn't get it going. Since it was feeding, it would have normally fed into here, but we needed it up here so we can modify it with the ALU. Um, all of the destination registers for our ALU are 64 bits, with the exception of multiplying, because um, with 64 bit sign multiplication, you'll need, or the result for that is a 128 bit result, and the results of that will be stored in two consecutive registers. This is our floating point data path. We didn't make any modifications to it. We didn't have to. So it's the same as the baseline one. And it's very similar to the uh, interior data path, uh, minus or much where we feed in something there. And both of these um, both of these modules, the integer data path and the floating point, point data path, perform basic operations, multiplying, adding, subtracting, dividing, and also logical operations. Our enhancements to the baseline process. We added a watchdog counter. Now this is, the, the way we did it was we just added a counter that would count uh, a jump, a jump, and a conditional jump loop. And if it went through that jump loop a certain amount of time, uh, we will recognize it as an error, and then we will go to a runaway state. For our design, our runaway state simply throws it into a halt, but it could be changed to do something else, such as a restart. Um, a practical use for this was let, let's say you want to use this processor in a cable box. Customers will find a way to break your program. So they push a certain amount of buttons and then it gets stuck in a certain portion of the code. Now, with this, with this watchdog timer, what you could have it do is you could have it just restart the box. Now, this won't fix your error. The error will still be there, but at least it will allow, you know, you'll, you'll be able to continue using your, your product and you can maybe debug it later as opposed to having a bunch of customers call you at once saying your stuff doesn't work. Um, this is our our instruction. Instruction format for um, the watchdog. We have five bits uh, that we can set up to the amount uh, for the trigger to trigger the uh, watchdog event uh, in our enable bit. Um, we probably could have made this a little bit larger. We probably should have, but for now it's only five bits. So it gets the the counter gets loaded and decremented. How often? Okay. Um, at the beginning of each, once it recognizes a jump instruction, at the beginning of each jump instruction, if the jump executes, we're incrementing it. We're not decrementing it, we're incrementing the counter. And then once the counter reaches that amount, uh, then it'll jump to uh, its runaway state. Go through that again, I got lost. Okay, so when we when we execute our jump instruction, it goes... Well, what jump instruction? Any conditional jump instruction. So the watchdog timer works for conditional jump instructions. Well, we, we figure that if you're doing like a, a non-conditional jump instruction, like a, a, just a regular jump instruction, you want to be stuck in a loop. So we don't, we don't want you to get stuck in a conditional jump. Is that what watchdog timers are for? This is what our thing. For loop, conditional loop instructions. So that way you don't get stuck in a conditional loop, I guess, of instructions. And so when does this get incremented or decremented and... It gets incremented when we uh, execute our conditional, a conditional jump instruction. We actually didn't include it, but we should have included this, the portion of the code that would increment the, uh, the counter. So you tested this? It's tested it. Okay. It's, yeah. It has the incrementing in the second line of code there, doesn't it? Yeah, but when does, how often does uh, that get I incremented? See. Sorry. When does that code get done? Watchdog counter equals... Plus one. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, this, this, okay. This gets done right after decode. And every decode. So every decode. Every decode state. So how long will it take? So you mean I can't have a loop greater than thirty-two? This is why this is this definitely could have been expanded on and should have been expanded on. So in your processor, you can't go through any more loops bigger than thirty-two. Currently, no. You wouldn't do this. Well, you could actually turn this off. So okay, so it's just if it t gets turned yeah, on. Yeah. Got it. So it, it's it's user. Yeah. Using your own risk type of thing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're you're, you're gonna when you write your own code, you're able to recognize how you know, right, right, much right. your loop's supposed to be gone. Right. Uh, 
Why did you limit yourself <coughs> to the five bits? I mean, you've got a bunch of zeros all over the place. Yeah, we definitely should have just made this larger. And by the way, this just by the way, this was some of the other groups did this, and I didn't bring it up the other day. But you know, you've got the fields; they might not be contiguous. Yeah. But you can just concatenate them together to create these bigger things that you need. So, like, you didn't have. 12 bits or whatever, 16 bits contiguous, but you had 5 bits here, you had another 5 bits over here that were spare, and another 3 bits over here. You can just use them all, because it's your format. Right, right. And then you just take them and concatenate them and use that for whatever. Right. So, because the idea is okay, as long as it's conditional, the user knows, okay, I don't want to get locked in this loop. I'm right. going to use this instruction for this loop. Right. And it's a great idea. Right. But you want to be able to have that loop as large as possible. Right. I actually probably should have put this in the interface too. Yeah, but this is a, a visual representation of, <laughs> of exactly how it works. So what I just kind of explained. Yeah. So does the counter uh, exceed the max amount? If it does, then we're going to a halt. We're stopping. Uh, if it doesn't, is the uh, is the instruction a conditional jump? No. Then it proceeds on with the instruction. Doesn't do anything. Right. If it is a conditional jump, then we're incrementing the counter. Uh, does the jump condition pass? So this means that the jump executed and we're going to wherever the jump's going. Yes? So continue with the instruction and we're jumping back to the beginning. If it doesn't, that means we're moving on with the program. The program's uh, proceeding as normal. So we just reset the counter, proceed with the instruction, and then do it again. Hopefully that flowchart helps a little bit more. Yeah. Now there are multiple conditional jumps, right? So yeah, it recognizes, it recognizes uh, all of them. Uh, it's, it's the same process for all of them. When, when do conditional jumps break, or what, what I don't understand why they need to watch the time of conditional jumps. We'll get to that. Next slide. Oh, yeah. okay. well, wait, wait, wait. Maybe, yeah, maybe we should hold on. While we're here, though, the, these tests that you show, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are they in particular states? Are they added states? What, what, where are those tests being done? Okay, so this this test... Like is, in fetch, do you test... No, we don't test anything in fetch. Fetch is... Decode, this, you test something. Yeah, de decode, we test this state, uh, that state, and then we'll increment there. And then from from here, it's it's the jump condition, like the jump instruction. Okay. So you didn't add any extra states. We added one, the runaway state, to throw it into... Okay, yeah, 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 but that's it. That's if the case happened. But in the, in the flow of fetch, decode, execute, nope. you're not adding any overhead to do this, which is great. You don't want to do that. In other words, you slow down the execution of every instruction for this one particular implementation. Well, we had a couple extra, I guess, processes such as incrementing and stuff, but that shouldn't... Nothing too significant or um, nothing... I'm significant. talking about adding an extra clock tick to do any oh, kind no, of no, testing. No, no, yeah. no. Doing more logic or yeah, more yeah. complicated logic no, in no. a state is okay. okay. So you were going to go on to something. Yeah, because to answer this question. Next yeah. slide. So this is how we tested. Um, this is our additional memory module for how we tested our um, watchdog timer. Okay, so you, you asked how will you get stuck in the conditional state. If getting stuck in a conditional state is an error condition, let's say you made a mistake in, your, in writing your code. So this is supposed to be a decrement because you're doing a jump, not zero, right? But for whatever reason, you put it in increment. So what's going to happen now is it's going to increment this register all the way up until it resets back or, or jumps back over to zero. That's going to take a very long time, and it's incorrect. Like your whatever instructions are going to be done here, which in this case we're not doing anything, but whatever instructions will be done there are going to be incorrect. Like, but you wouldn't know. You, you'd have no way of knowing. So what this does is it'll jump you uh, after you go through a certain amount of uh, loop cycles. It'll jump you through a halt state and just you know cut it off for you. And I'll tell you what. Next one. So this is this is an example of what happened. That was your trace. Yeah. So what we did, it's a little hard to see, but what we did here is you're loaded uh, the IR, and you can see it. So we have here our jump going through, our jump going through, our jump going through. And it, it actually goes through much, many more times. But uh, right here, it catches the jump, and it's already exceeded the amount that we limited to. So then it, it, it stops it. Stops it. The watchdog timer has stopped the program at that amount of time. So you can trace it back if you have the time of where your problem is possibly happening. Okay. And basically, we just, um, to reiterate why we included this, is just for defensive programming and just to make sure 
um, the processor works at its best performance and it doesn't break down whenever um, the user decides to make any kind of um, electronics to break the program or whatever it's doing. So our feature enhancements for our processor, um, like what Brandon mentioned earlier, we wanted to make our timer um, expand to uh, multiple instructions, not just like 32 bits that it's limited to. And we also wanted to um, have the timer count in terms of um, the clock seconds and not just by um, using a counter. Mm -hmm. And optimize certain baseline instructions. You could speed up your processor by just removing a certain amount of fetch instructions, fetch and decode. So we, what we were thinking is one of the instructions we could add was a load 64 immediate. Uh, so instead of having to go through the process of uh, load immediate and then or high, adding in that extra decode and fetch state, we could probably cut that out and make that one instruction like a previous group did yesterday, which is actually a pretty good idea. Uh, and that, that should speed up functionality just a little bit. What would that do to pipelining? Pipeline. This, pipeline. Is, this is the trouble with adding, you know, just saying we're going to do this. Somebody said that yesterday, and yeah. that's the trouble with those type of things. That's why, as, as what Mips just says, okay, 32 bits, that's it. So the pipeline will never have to get messed up or stalled for that exception. So we have four exceptions, right? Mary Kay brought that up. So just saying now we're going to have another one that's that's another exception that's going to be three word instruction. Right. So it's it's a positive on you don't fetch and decode. Right. But it's a right. negative it in the bigger in the bigger right. picture. Right. It's just something to talk about. Right. Yeah. And this concludes our presentation. Um, we're opening up the floor to additional questions and suggestions for how we can make our process better. Right. If you're going to implement the watch out timer, instead of having five bits for like a count up to or count from value, could you use those five bits to control like what a register gets loaded to and then maybe even use that as like, you know, your, your uh, period of waiting. So you could wait, you know, like 32 clock ticks between things or wait 10 clock ticks. Great. And that way you can like expand it. Because I see what I see. Because you're saying, you're saying to use that instead of setting it like, a, like an immediate amount, to set it as like point to a register. And, and the register that. has the count. And then have the register have the count. Because if you have 64 bits of 64 bits, and then you got huge counts. So you could true. Do. We could we could do that. It's a great but idea. But then you have to like just leave that register alone and not touch it with your other. Yeah, but having one one extra register in your machine enables to use your watch chart timer instead of limiting the program to 32 clock ticks is yeah. going to sell your processor. We could add that. That's a good idea. That's good. Yeah. yeah, another suggestion um, I was thinking of is, um, so right now what your processor does is it goes into a halt state. Right. And so um, okay, as, well, as far as um, it, like helping out the functionality that's going to be useful for the debugger, but once it's out in the field that's not useful, it's basically the same as being stuck right. in the loop. So uh, what, what uh, you guys could do is um, in another register field, you can have like a uh, register jump. And like, so, like an interrupt type of thing? Well, sort of. So um, you can point to another register where when that timer goes out, it can basically do like a jump register to that place to jump out of it. Okay, okay. but the issue that we have with that is let's say you're doing instructions before that, like add instructions, stuff like that. You already went through a loop in an excess amount of time that you didn't expect to go through a loop of the add instructions. So now those registers are now in place. Mm -hmm. So then, I don't know. We, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's almost like an interrupt, but you can point to like a place to go fix the problem or go back and start the process over. Oh, okay, you can point back and try and repeat it and see if that's like good. That's a good idea, too. Okay. Anyone? I'm just going to jump on this conversation. We haven't covered interrupts in our particular class this semester or exception handling, but so that's unfortunate because it's ex exactly what you do. You would throw an exception, it's just like an interrupt if the watchdog timer times out, and you go to a routine and let the routine do whatever it wants to do. Mm -hmm. If it wants to halt, it halts. If it wants to recover, it recovers. But that's what's done. Right. It doesn't just, uh, in our case, it's just, you know, initial idea. Yeah, yeah. That's what the so it's a good idea. But you just do an interrupt and let the system software do whatever kind of recovery or non-recovery mm -hmm. it wants to do. Rather than you make the decision, you just say, this is what, we're going to go to this interrupt service routine. 
and you just allocate a special vector for that, like we go to 3FF for a general interrupt request. So you go, we're going to say 3FE is going to be our watchdog timer okay. exception. You go there and get an address and go to that routine. Right, we could do that. that, that that's yeah, what yeah, would be do. done. Okay. You mentioned defensive programming. I've never really heard of that, but if, if your watchdog timer prevents you from, I guess, maybe finding some kind of loophole or something in that 32 bits of jumping between conditionals, is there anything else you research besides watchdog timers that could help brute force hardware attacks or something that you know about? Help brute force. I mean, defensive programming on a hardware level, is there anything else that you... I guess we're using that term a little liberally, but if mistakes happen in your code, you know, it, it's here... Oh, defending from the program. Uh, defending from the program, okay. Defending from the programmer's mistakes, I guess, is a okay. better way to put okay. it. Would you kind of say it's kind of like putting hooks in there for the programmer to develop his code? If that's kind of the idea that I guess. Seems like yeah. Yeah. Like maybe for debugs, so. yeah, just okay. just for the programmer's use, you know, that type of thing. You wouldn't really use it real time. Okay. In that case, it's kind of an interesting concept, right? Like the JTAG. Yeah. Extra hardware for your debug. Any more? Questions, comments? Aren't you guys having fun in this fall? Oh, you know, I, mean, I, like, I, like this, yeah, I like this. To be able to get feedback and suggestions is what it... Yeah, we really appreciate yeah. the suggestions that you guys have. Any other? Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you.